In episode 406 of the Clive Barker podcast, Jose and Ryan are joined by Ian and writer-director Bernard Rose as we talk about Candyman and many other aspects of his life and career. Thanks to Ian for helping us put this together. This episode is sponsored by Don Bertram Celebrate Imagination. Don Bertram Celebrate Imagination shop is dedicated to benefiting the arts and medicine program at Texas Children's Cancer Center. Over 50% of the proceeds go to the Texas Children's Cancer Center, where artist Don Bertram volunteers monthly. Don Bertram is a longtime friend of Clive and celebrates and continues to be inspired by his art. He uses that inspiration to help kids through the Texas Children's Cancer Center, and we couldn't be more thrilled to continue to work with him. There's a news feature video that shows Don working with the kids at Texas Children's Cancer Center and his artwork. Click the side banner at www.clivebarkercast.com to find links to the video and his Etsy shop where you can buy his prints, books, and support this wonderful program. As of today, May 28th, 2023, there are some new paintings to check out in Don Bertram's Etsy shop. Hi guys, welcome to the Clyde Barker podcast. Today is episode 406, uh, and today we have as uh, as a guest director Bernard Rose, who directed movies like like Paper House, Candyman, Frankenstein, Ivan's Ecstasy, Traveling Light, and Samurai Marathon. He's directed music videos for Frankie Goes to Hollywood, Relax, you may remember that one, uh, and for other artists as well. Uh, we love his work, and we're very happy to welcome you to the show today to chat a little bit about your work. How are you doing, Bernard? I'm well, thank you. I'm good. As usual, we're joined by Ryan. Hi. And How's Ian. It going? Hello. Yeah. So, thank you so much for being here today. Um, where are you? Where are you talking to us from? I'm talking to you from my living room. In. Do I have to reveal my location? In case no. You... No. <laughs> no. You're at an undisclosed location. I'm, I'm in Los, no, I'm in Los Angeles. It's okay. okay. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so you're in Los Angeles, but uh, you grew up in London, correct? Yes. So um, what was it like uh, when you were younger? What, what were the first inspirations that got you in love with film? Well, you know, I think what was really great I was a teenager in the 70s, and in the 70s, there was this kind of really fabulous culture of, of you know, movies were the, the central to, to everything in, in that era. You know, there was no, what was on TV was, certainly in the UK, was just what was on the BBC and what was on one commercial channel. So there was very little aimed at anybody who had even slightly unusual tastes. But, you know, London was covered in um, a network of independent movie theatres, which, which, which used to show everything, uh, you know, repertory films and, and recent releases and obscure experimental things. And sometimes they would turn into clubs and show, you know, pretty outrageous things and even semi-pornographic things, you know, and things... Sure. That, you know, the famous things that we know as midnight movies from the 70s, obviously, but much more depth to it than just those films. You know, when I'm talking about the midnight movies in the 70s, you know, I'm talking about Pink Flamingos and The Razorhead. And yeah. Those movies, which, of course, were very, very important back in the mid 70s. And they were, you know, they, they were um, they were like a form of rock and roll almost. They weren't, yeah. um, you know, the. The grown-ups didn't ever watch those movies, but the kids would go into the theaters and they would, you could smoke in the movie theaters back then, you know, and they would they would fucking light up joints and they would oh, smoke wow. themselves into a stupor. You didn't wow. really have to buy any joints. You could just walk into the theater and sit there. There was this place called the Scala, which originally was in Tottenham Street. And I, I have a memory of one day I was, I actually worked there because, of course, the secret was was to work there because then you could not only go and see all the movies for free, but you could go to all the other movie theaters for free. Sure. Oh, wow. um, the, the, because we used to let them in, they would let us in, you know. And um, I remember one night there was this some screening at the Scala. I don't know what was on screen, but I remember um, Shane McGowan from the Pogues at the back of the theater decided he needed to take a piss and and he 
piss back behind the last seat and the piss was just running it was slightly sloped down it was running down underneath all the seats and you could see all the people uh, jumping out of the way of this sort of river uh, of piss oh. in the back of the theater so it was a bit like that and there were fights in there and yeah kind of it was like a sort of punk club cinema it was great <laughs> nothing like it. The, the, wow. the closest thing even vaguely to that is um tarantino's theater the, the new beverly but mm -hmm. it, it's an attempt to recreate that but it's too clean mm. i get it yeah i get it too good it's, i mean it's great but it's not the same thing you know it's a recreation rather than the real thing yeah they had a screening of the nightbreed director's cut at the new beverly uh, oh yeah many years ago and then we were there for uh, the Nightbreed screening at the uh, Crest in Westwood. Westwood. Yeah. yeah. And beautiful, beautiful theaters there, but they're too clean, right? It's like something's no, that's missing. That's so great. Yeah. yeah. I, I grew up in Portugal, so I'm Portuguese. I only moved to the United States in 2013. So uh, where I grew up, we also had just a couple of channels on TV, and uh, we would have to, they were called, um, you know, they were they were state TV and they were um, basically generalist channels where you would have soap operas, news, movies, you know, cartoons all in the same channel. Um, so, yeah, I, I, you know, I didn't have a lot to. But I remember at night watching movies like, you know, Universal Films and stuff like that, uh, Universal Monster Movies. Um, and uh, I, I still remember the tiny, dirty, dingy kind of like movie theaters that you would go into and it's like there's a little concession stand with some chocolate and candy and you could have coffee or whatever and then you know really uh kind of broken seats here and there and of course now you walk into a place and it's like now they got beds in th in theaters where you can sit I hate on that by the way when I, they yeah the couches in the theater it's like if i want if i want i just i sit in those things and and 10 seconds later i'm fast asleep yeah, right that's what would happen to me too I hate yeah. that. That was a terrible mistake. That's an early aughts mistake. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Couches out the theater. Yeah, I you agree. Don't, don't, don't make the theater like your home. You know, make a theater in your home if you want, but put flip up seats in it. The whole point of it, the whole, the whole function of a movie theater is two things. One, obviously for the projection, but two, most importantly, so that people don't talk to you while you're watching it. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah there's nothing worse than if you're trying to watch something it's why people say oh i sit, sit every watch everything on streaming i mean you mean you sit there and basically check your email and talk to people while you're watch, watching in invert you're not watching the film mm. you're listening to it you know it's it's terrible it's terrible uh they they bring blankets and they wear pajama bottoms to the theater and it's like that's that something's missing there there's a certain kind of like stay immersion home. in the movie that's what you want stay home yeah yeah, it <laughs> yeah. gets lost. It gets lost that immersion in the movie when you got your phone and a, a big plate of French fries in front of you. And oh, whatever. I it's hate like, that when they serve the food and it's yeah, smells. it's it's not the same. I, I miss some idiot walking in front of you with a yeah. hamburgers. No, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, some some really good names you brought up like Eraserhead, and uh, we just lost Kenneth Anger uh, recently. Uh, which, two days ago, two days yeah, ago. yeah, it was yeah. really sad. Well, um, yeah, yeah, and you know, I think that he was very important to um, that whole ethos, you know, particularly of course. the operation of the Pleasure Dome, um, which was a direct influence, obviously, on the Frankie as to Hollywood videos, and and also even on the album title, which was called Welcome to the Pleasure Dome, which is a reference to Ke Kenneth Anger. But I think. I think what Anger did is, apart from his his visual lexicon, which which was extraordinary, but I think also people always forget that he wrote that incredible, scabrous, basically fictional book, Hollywood Babylon, which tells all the most repulsive scandals he can find in Hollywood. But I think he understood whether or not the stuff was true. This is stuff that was talked about in the 50s in Hollywood. And he just pulled together all the most toxic negative stories about Hollywood. And that in a weird way became a part of the Hollywood myth. You know, to the point where someone like Damien Ch Chazelle calls his film Babylon. It's really in reference to Kenneth Anger's book, but he doesn't have the 
quite the courage to go to the pure vitriol and seediness that anger revels in. But it's his reveling in that seediness combined with an absolute love of the glitter and the stardom uh, and the kind of high camp of ho classic Hollywood that makes anger so important. And I think that is visually represented in his films, but I think in terms of his his aesthetic Hollywood Babylon is almost as important as the movies, the book, you know. Yeah, that, that was banned in the U.S. for years, I believe. Um, well, partly because it's basically fiction. Right, right. Almost nothing <laughs> is true. But, you know, I, I can remember every single one of the nonsense stories. That I, I, It's basically, he's repeating all the bad gossip he heard in the 50s. But you know what, that's kind of great, too. Sure, sure. You kind of tackle that a little bit to some extent with... Uh... Ivan's ecstasy, right? Yeah, you see, I think that's the point that the toxic, the, the Hollywood's, the, the, its period of pure glamour was very brief. And by the time Billy Wilder made Sunset Boulevard, the idea that actually there was a really toxic dark side to Hollywood had taken hold already. And I think the way that Billy Wilder used Gloria Swanson and Buster Keaton and Cecil DeMille who were the real deal? They were the people who built the town. And they're in his movie, basically saying they're sad sacks who are washed up. Even though DeMille's directing a big movie, he's 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 full of melancholy when, when Gloria Swanson comes to his set, you know? And I think it's that thing, even Singing in the Rain, which everyone thinks of as this sort of happy-go-lucky musical, it's a film about a woman whose career is ended by the silent era because her voice is too working class. Right. That right. Is. And it's yeah. actually a really tragic story. It's because it's told from, from Gene Kelly's point of view, we accept it, but he's actually, he's a very obnoxious character in the film. And I always sympathize with uh, with Lena Horne, the, the, with the, the, the one that they always make fun of in the film, but cause I think she's just, she's just wonderful. Did you know that she dubbed um, Debbie Reynolds' voice pretending to be her? It's actually her. Who did oh. uh, did her own dubbing because she was a much better actress than Debbie Reynolds. <laughs> so because she's playing, she's playing that really crazy dumb character, but she's also playing the posh version too. And I think she does the singing voice at the end as well. So it's a wonderfully wow. ironic. I mean, you know, who would leave her for Debbie Reynolds? Not me. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Debbie Reynolds is like the ultimate, like boring character. But it's very yeah. 50s. But I think what's lovely about seeing in the rain, one of the reasons it's a masterpiece, is that you can view it from so many different angles and, and every one of them works. I mean, it is a masterpiece. I'm not knocking Debbie Reynolds, I'm saying the film's a masterpiece. No. <laughs> no. Yeah. But all um, those films, Sunset Boulevard, um, Singing in the Rain, they're all very, much closer to Kenneth Anger than you think. And mm -hmm. my Darren, and I think that, you know, you definitely have to say that David Lynch synthesized a lot of that too in- um, Oh yeah, um, in Mulholland Drive. In all of his films, but Mulholland Drive and in Lost Highway too, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, David's always lived up in the Hollywood Hills. I think Lost Highway, I think he's shot in his house. Well, he loves the light. He says the yeah. light in Los Angeles makes him think of freedom and, and you know, for some reason that that works for him so you know yeah and, and he's a hollywood guy everyone forgets yeah. the right head was shot in um the, the big mansion in beverly hills the, mm -hmm. the afi you know people think yeah. it was shot somewhere in some weird eastern industrial city no 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 not at all it was shot in beverly hills it was yeah in it's really expensive to shoot there too right it's the permit yeah yeah <laughs> um how did you get into uh, directing music videos? What was your first, you know, entry entry into the? Um, well, you know, I was I was making films all the time. I was going to the movie theater in the seventies, making amateur films, and mm -hmm. made quite a few of them. What um, was that that short that you did that ended up being played in the BBC? Yeah, it's called A Bomb with No Name on it. It's on the Candyman DVD, by the oh. way. Oh, it's in this one. Oh, yeah, it's blurred. Or maybe not that one. On the Arrow one. Oh, the arrow one, right. Uh, yeah. What one is that? Uh, this is the collector's edition from Shout Factory, I believe. Oh, yeah, the, yeah, that's not as good as the arrow disc. My advice uh, is buy the arrow disc. 
I'll have to get that one then. Yeah. Because it's got my 70s shorts on it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'll, so, I'll have to get that. The Arrow Disc is better. So anyway, those films I made in the 70s are all available on the Arrow Candyman Disc. So you can kill two birds with one stone. You can get your Arrow Candyman Disc and one. <laughs> Sure. We'll add that to the show notes here. So the fact that they still are in distribution, I think, is pretty good. All these years later, yeah, 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 yeah. No, absolutely. And, the, and so these hmm. things were shot on like um, Kodachrome reversal on sixteen more Bolexes, you know. So I was playing around with all that stuff, and and after and you know, sometime after that, I went to work for. Um, I was working in the movie theater, and then I went to work for Jim Henson on uh, Dark Crystal. Oh, it's mm. one of my favorites. In the creature shop, in his in Jim's creature shop. So I was there for a while. And then I went to film school. And while I was at film school, I started making music videos because I had access to equipment, basically. So um, music, and this was very, in the very early days of MTV. It was 1983. Right. Bands and, didn't make music videos at the time, right? Usually it was like some live performance or whatever. In they Europe, didn't really... the, MTV hadn't started in Europe. Yeah, right. I remember I, the Super Channel. I used to watch the Super Channel. Yeah, you remember that? Yeah, but that's way later, I think. Yeah, it was no really even basic cable in Europe in nineteen. Yeah, it was satellite. I remember being young and listening to Nino Ferretto. Yeah, the on satellite. The Super I think Channel or something. comes in about 85, 86. It's a few. It's a couple yeah. of years. But yeah, you're right. Once the satellite channels appeared, MTV started up in Europe. But prior to that, basically, you couldn't operate a TV channel in Europe unless you were the government. Um, and uh, not true in America, of course, because basic cable started much sooner in America um, with HBO and, and the fact that, of course, in America, they always had much more difficulty covering the entire country with a signal. So people yeah. like being boondocks never got good reception. It's why cable took off so fast in America. Yeah. In Portugal, we only got basic cable around the early 90s i think no that's I when think they yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but you had satellite in the 80s I'm yeah sure. we, we did yeah yeah um so. and everyone had those dishes on their house remember no one mm -hmm. they were gone every single one of them was gone that that you see it's, it's always i'm always thinking about how do you do period recreations no one is ever going to be able to do the 80s now without CGIing a bunch of dishes onto people's aerials. Hands. <laughs> you know those big aerials with all the yeah. parallel things and That's whatever. Like, it was yeah. terrible. It looked horrible. We like, still have one of those on our house. They were like a prop from the 50s, weren't they? Yeah. They were like something out of. Um, it came from out of space. Yeah, like something that you'd find on the Sputnik satellite or something. You know, they were was... really crude, and they never worked properly. They were always like, yeah, missing something, and they go, they, they kind of half crap out you get a porno channel instead you know <laughs> uh, uh, uh encoded and then you had to like do the little you know jiggle with a channel and see if you could get it unencrypted that's exactly what you said <laughs> you had to play with it it was really funny people had to struggle yeah for their masturbation yeah. back in the day well nowadays we're in a, a, a lot more of uh, instant gratification right you want to listen to the single boom you go to spotify you got it right there on demand right you want to watch something go on youtube and you'll find it immediately back then we struggled we had to go to the theater to watch a movie That's and right. if it was sold out you had to go home and watch tv that night and it's yeah. a bit like you know in russia when they when when they used to ban literature during the soviet era People used to hand write books out like Bulgakov's Master and Margaret. Wow. Oh, yeah, yeah. Pass them and around as manuscripts. And then, of course, once the Soviet Union fell and everything became available, everyone stopped reading. Did you ever hear about that uh, in, in the West Berlin? Um, they had like, they couldn't have Western music in there. So some people would press these like records on old x rays. So you can see like a, a, a uh, an acetate of an x-ray with music on it and then you're looking at some poor sod's bones that you know some x-ray that they took it's crazy well, the, the stuff to make press um, records is very expensive the yeah the vinyl and you know i know that that like you know some of these reggae labels in jamaica used to press them out of um, trash container lids oh, oh wow. like just plastic regular plastic yeah, yeah. i mean like it was very those little violent vinyl pellets they put in the thing are very expensive. Yeah, yeah. Get hold of. So how does relax uh, happen? 
Well, the the first video I did was actually for um, I was I was at the film school and um, I, I you know this is back long before cell phones. It was in August nineteen eighty three, and the phone was ringing. I was cutting my film and obviously on on film, and the felt and it's, and the phone was ringing in the corridor, and I picked it up, and it was um, it was this guy Brian Travis who was a sax player in this band and he, he said he wanted a video made and um, would I come and meet him in Birmingham the following day and I went and met him and we went and listened to the record and I made the video and I went up there I took a, a, a van and some equipment and some friends and we made this video and delivered it to them didn't think very much of it and a week later it was number one all over the world and that was um, Red Red Wine by UB40 and it oh, was yeah it was one of those kind of extraordinary things sometimes you know you can't really you know sometimes success just happens very quickly and so after that I had a brief period where everyone in the music business now thought the only reason this record was a hit was because of this video and that they had to they had to hire the guy who made it so I became very I got I got offered everything and um one of the things I was off, I was offered all kinds of big bands, and I did quite a few of them, to be honest with you. And uh, one of the things I was offered in November 1983 was Relax by Frankie Goes to Hollywood. I was brought it by Paul Morley, who was the very interesting and inventive guy who was running the marketing at ZTT Records. And he was, he was, you know, he was, he, he'd been a journalist at the New Musical Express, and he was, mm -hmm. um, he was kind of like a kind of postmodern modernist performance art version of a record company executive is the only way I can describe him. He was, he was extraordinary and extremely funny and I loved him. Yeah. And, uh, and he just would say the most crazy things and he played me this record and I was like, this is fantastic. Let's make it. And I met with Holly and Paul and I loved them. And so. Yeah. You know, Holly Johnson. Yeah. And I just said to Molly, you know, what, what can we do? Can, and he, he said, do whatever you want. I said, well, you know, I want to do what, you know, represent their culture in the same way that we represented um, UB40 in, in Red Red Wine in the pub. And and, I, and so, you know, it had to be the underground gay culture of that era, which was pretty much what's in the film. And we, you know, we went to heaven and we picked up the people who were in the film. And, right put them in the movie and, and, we, and we shot it and we had a lot of fun doing it. And I just thought it was good and fun and sweet. And yeah. I, and then of course I found out that Paul had never really asked the people who ran the record company anything about this. So when I delivered it to them, they were like, <laughs> what is this? <laughs> what, what is this? Uh, this is obscene. I know. It's like, even, even to do today's standards, I was watching it this morning again. I was like, I forgot how, how intense this gets when he's on the wheel turning and there's like when water the, when, You mean when he yeah. peeks off the balcony, yeah. Yeah, I yeah. Know. It's kind of a, a Roman orgy kind of thing, right? Going on with the guy with the Later. toga. I've never yeah. been to a Roman orgy. I'm not quite that old. <laughs> yeah. At least he didn't include a vomitorium. No, but no. It, yeah, I, I mean, honestly, I thought it was fun more than anything, but, but it was one of those interesting things, but other people were shocked by it and uh, including... This guy, Mike Reed, who worked at the BBC, and he was shocked by it and decided to ban the record on air, which had, had, of course, the reverse effect of making it the biggest hit that year by a huge mar margin. I mean, it was number one yeah. weeks and weeks and weeks. And then the rest of the songs they did on that same album were hugely successful. But yeah, it was one of those odd moments where where it, uh, it, was, a, it was ignorance combined with stupidity and a little bit of money and 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 basically i i just took paul morley at his word he said yeah do something outrageous okay and i gave it to them they refused they, at first they didn't want to pay for it the record company they were like we can't pay for this because we can't use it uh -huh. but of course once the record was a huge hit it was a different matter i was like no you better pay me because i'm <laughs> yeah no i mean transgressive is is not even close to uh to describing it, but it, it's so much fun. And uh, well, I think it was, like, it was also a very significant moment because it was the first, they were the first, Holly and Paul were the first openly gay pop stars. Sure. And they weren't openly gay in a 
um, campaigning way. It was mm -hmm. just who they were. And yeah. I think that Holly, they would say things to Holly, are you this, are you that? And you go, you know, I'm just a person. I'm just, you know, it's just sex. What do you, what, I'm just, you know, he was, he was just doing his, doing, being who he was. And I think that was really powerful. And, you know, later I actually, later that same year, I did the, the, um, video for Bronski Beat for Small Town Boy. Oh, I just bought that album the other day. That's crazy. Oh, yeah. That's such a oh, great it's so record. good. Yeah. And that is a message video and a message song in a way that Relax wasn't. But Relax came first, which everyone forgets, including including all the guys from Bronski Beat, two of whom mm -hmm. were sadly died. Yeah. With, with very tragic. One of them very tragic. Both, I mean, both tragic, but one of them it was a kind of awful situation. Mm -hmm. But, um, I think um, you know it was it was a moment where these things first came into the mainstream and first came into like the public consciousness. Yeah, I remember seeing the Relax music video on TV in Portugal many times, and uh, nobody had anything to say about it. It was just you know a, a regular music video that was on rotation, and right. yeah, great I, I people loved... liked Relax. That was why it was powerful, you know. Yeah. It was so it was, I think, a really significant moment in terms of gay culture being accepted in the mainstream. And I think there was that opportunity in that moment in 83. And then yeah. of course, the crisis came along. And, and then you had a Bronsky beat yeah. and you had Jimmy Somerville and the Communards, you That's know, right. it's all it's just that music is so good. I just love but, that stuff. In Portugal, we were very much in touch with uh, with England, you know, Britain hmm. and all the music was that I listened to. I had an older brother, so you know he's collecting all these records. And I'm listening to them, so I, I was growing up on that from an early age. Yeah. Now I have something interesting to tell you. Did you know? And I'm sure you didn't, because why would you? Mm Holly -hmm. Johnson grew up like four streets behind Penny Lane in Liverpool, and you know who was lived in the street over as a child? Oh, Clive. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. They literally were from the same block. But uh, uh, I know it's kind of crazy, and I I suspect I suspect they went to similar places at certain times. Sure, sure. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. I, I did actually ask Holly once, did he ever meet Clive in his professional capacity? And <laughs> he was like, "Well, mate. I like the distinction." <laughs> <laughs> you know, but yeah, yeah, no, it was very funny, and and you you wouldn't know because Clive is very much like he he he's. He's, I mean, he's still. I mean, it's not like he doesn't say he's from there, and, and that was his roots. But, but he, he, he's such a sort of erudite intellectual soul, you know. Right. That, right. You, that it sometimes, sometimes people people forget where he came from, you know. But I, I know very well where he came from, you know. Yeah, absolutely. It, um, but it's cool. But it was also, it's also one of the things that's very cool about Clive. I think you know is that he mm -hmm. has, is that he's somebody who really transcended his his upbringing in many ways but it you know, still sure. finds its way into all of his 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 works his books you know his his uh, short yeah. stories yeah yeah liverpool think... makes its way whether it's like proximity to the water like in in other books that he has like weave world i think it takes place in liverpool there's another fantasy land that aberat that's in a sea so there's always like this idea of growing up by the sea and stuff like that and uh and, and of course, Candyman is absolutely set in Liverpool. Well, it's not. Right. It's actually set in Birkenhead. It's set across the water in, um, I forgot the name of the place. But this, this. Anyway, it's an area which is people in Liverpool consider really awful and they wouldn't go there. But, sure. it, but it's just this idea of a part of the city that's, that's too scary and dangerous to enter, which definitely exists there. It certainly did, you know. Mm. Things have changed. Everywhere's been gentrified. You know? And and Frankie goes to Hollywood is is back on back to touring, right? Mm, maybe. I think so. I think they played again. And they played recently. one. They played one song. Just one. Yeah. At the introduction to the um, Eurovision Song Contest, and I'm sure. I hope. I I would. I think it'd be great if they did get back into it. But you know, it's not. In the end, that's not my decision. You know. I haven't read the. His mm -hmm. memoir, Holly Johnson's memoir, A Bone yes. in My Flute. But it's very uh, funny. I recommend it. <laughs> yeah. That's what you're using uh, as a basis for the uh yeah, the no, musical. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. It's based on Holly's book. 
and um, it does. Holly does not talk about Clive, but um, I think Holly and Clive do know each other. I know they've spoken mostly because they used to be neighbors. Uh, like I said, I'm not sure if they knew each other back in the day, but it's like we're playing Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon. Well, yeah, no, but I mean, it's they really did grow up in the same. But Clive is somewhat older than Holly, I think. Yeah. By, uh, maybe five or six years, you know. Yeah, I think he was born in '52. So yeah, Clive was born. Yeah, Clive is eight years older than me. Clive was born in '52. Yeah. Yeah, Holly was born in '60. Yeah, mm. so they were a little older. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So you mentioned Candyman. Um. But before that, I was watching yesterday this wonderful movie that you did called Paper House. Oh yes. Oh, it's so good. And uh, I posted about it on my social media and immediately some people from England started commenting on it uh, to, to tell me how much they love that movie. And um, that little girl did a heck of a job in that movie. That was a, a beautiful film. Yeah. And she's never done anything since. Really? Not so that one was thing. one and done. Wow. One and done. Huh. I think she became a lawyer. I, I spoke to her maybe in the night, late 90s. Mm -hmm. Put me out of the blue um, because the little boy who was in the film had died in rather tragic circumstances, oh, um, yeah. and so he she contacted me and um, and I had a rather nice chat with her. But yeah, she absolutely she she did not enjoy the experience of making a film. Interestingly enough, mm -hmm. I don't. Think well, being the protagonist for someone who had never been a child actor before, I could see how that would be a little stressful. I think it was, yeah, I think in retrospect, it's it's an awful lot to put on the shoulders of, I mean, she's she's actually, she was older than she appeared in the movie because um, it, she's in every single scene and it, it, you know, obviously there are very limited hours you can work with somebody under certain ages. I think she had to be over 12. I can't remember exactly how old she was, but I think she was 13 or 14. She definitely was over 12, even though she's sort of playing. I, I love... Yeah, yeah. Well, you have to, right? Um, it's just like you couldn't get the hours. But you know, it's right. you know, people that age aren't used to going to work. You know, they don't understand what it's like. And if it's weeks and weeks, you know, and um, and 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 I think that you know, I, we ended up in the studio doing this sort of really nightmarish stuff. I think she found it frightening actually because it was all happening, and you know, and Ben Cross was there, and he was smashing his way through windows. Right, the father. And with his eyes all poked out. So that was not in the original book, right? That was that was not even um, slightly. right. The, yeah. the original book is much more of a YA book. I mean, obviously, the film suffers from not being clear who, what its audience was. I mean, commercially suffered for that. Um, right. The book is much more of a somewhat old-fashioned YA book. Um, but I think the film has a lot more edge to it, which is what I like about it. But I think you could also criticize the film for having a really good, scary second act and then dropping that for the, in the third act, which I think also is, you know, people don't like it when you mix and match thing, things. I mean, you know, they don't. They kind of... they, want they don't know how to classify it, I guess, or market it. Yeah, I think that's part, partly what it is. I, I remember actually... Uh, Roger Ebert playing it in his um, Forgotten Film Festival, and he introduced it, and he had it, he, he hadn't seen it since it came out, and he had it down as a children's matinee, and, and he was there, and I saw him, and I said, are you sure about this, Roger? And he said, what do you mean? I said, it's quite scary for little kids. You're going to bring a bunch of kids there, and you're going to get in a lot of trouble. And he'd forgotten that it was scary, oh, how it is, you know? But because it is, I think, you know? It's, right, uh, yeah, it is. Uh, and I think I, I appreciate the introduction of that scary element because I think I think at some level, every child at some point feels a little scared of their dad. Um, hopefully. Yeah, right. Um, so I think that that is and and I I'm a guy, so I don't know what it's like to grow up as a, a, a young girl. But I, I think that you're more used to thinking of because you introduce these little things in the story, right? Where it's like, oh, dad looks drunk in this picture. And and so maybe he's been drunk before and she's seen him drunk, or maybe he's been rough, or maybe he's, you know, been rude and she sees that. So 
in her mind, that kind of builds that kind of scary, monolithical, absent kind of father who, so yeah, I could see that, uh, you know, I could see that. My my dad was an immigrant, so he he was in Canada a lot of the time, and he would come back for a few months, live with us, and then he would go back to Canada to work some more um, and make more money out uh, as an immigrant. Um, so yeah, I, I kind of got that idea that he was at a oil rig and then he comes back so there's that kind of absent father kind of thing where you're not connecting to your dad that much and so it kind of scary when he's around uh, yeah i think that's right well uh, you know i um and i think i think um it, it's an interesting film and I, it's very interesting it's also yeah. interesting in the the way the method of its manufacture I mean, there's no way, it, even if you had all the money in the world, you wouldn't, couldn't and wouldn't make the film the way we made it then. Yeah. You know, that those landscapes were actually built in a, in a soundstage at Pinewood. They're gorgeous. The house is gorgeous. And it's funny because you look at your kid drawings, they always have the same kind of house, right? With the Spanish roof and the square yeah. windows and the I, door. I remember when we were actually auditioning kids, one of the things we did was have them all make a drawing of a house while they were waiting. And not one of them made a drawing that looked any different. It's like yeah. some sort of weird thing in children's minds. I mean, uh, you know, according to the psychoanalysts, it's the house is a depiction of your body, in as yeah. much that the attic is your head, and 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 you know, there's always a kind of a face on it, and obviously the the basement is like the bowels of the womb, or you know, the it's and it and the the staircase is the gullet. It's it's like a body. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I like that. I like that uh, that symbolism. I have a friend of mine. He commented when I posted, because your movie is now on YouTube channel, is on the YouTube films and TV channel, uh, free with ads. People can watch it there. Uh, and one of my friends said, I love this movie. I have it on a UK DVD. When I first saw it, I mourned for his unmade version of The Thief of Always. So at one point, you thought about working with The Thief of Always story by Clive Barker? Well, uh, yeah, more than thought about it. I mean, we, we were developing the film quite seriously with uh, Universal for a couple of years, actually, in the late 90s. Oh. And, and you know, we had screenplays and we had art departments doing drawings. And, you know, we were quite um, seriously trying to mount the production. Oh. Uh, and it fell over in the end, I think, partly because, you know... It was before Harry Potter or any of that. And if we yeah. had made it, you know, we could have we could have taken that niche. And I think it's a real shame that we never did make it. But I think they were because Clive's book hadn't had the cultural impact that Harry Potter had. And I mean it did, but not obviously on the same level. I mean almost sure. like had. Yeah. I, mean, I think Harry, Harry Potter it, followed it, through, yeah, with a lot it's of it's only, it's only one book, yeah. I'm not even talking about the series of books. I'm talking about at that moment, like around 97, 98, when there weren't five Harry Potter books. There was probably right. yeah. one or two. But the first book was so huge and there was such a sort of feeding frenzy for for people to mount that. I think it... And, and the, the Thief of Always was going to be expensive. I think now, obviously, with the technology, it would be a lot. You could do it cheaper and you could do it easier, but it was... It was going to be an expensive movie, and I just, I there comes a point you can always tell with the studio where they go, this film is too much money, and you know it, it falls between stools. I'm sure that if if I've made it with Clive at that period, it would have been an expensive folly because it would have been too dark for them, too weird for them. I'm sure they would have ended up hating it, but it would have been great. Yeah, yeah. was it planned to be a live action movie? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. They then subsequently, or initially, it was developed as a, as a, as an animation at Paramount. Then I developed it at Universal with Clive as a live action movie. And then after that, they tried to do it with ILM as a um, CGI movie, and that never went anywhere either. And now there's so much money against it that no one could afford to make it, which is really sad when you think about it, because you'd yeah. have to pay off three failed attempts by major studios to launch it. 
That's a oh. lot. That is, yeah. Oh, I mean, wow. that, you, you'd be looking at $25 million before you even shot a frame of it. So it's oh. never going to happen, that book, which is no. really sad. It's a beautiful story. I mean, yeah, Cl Clive believed in it so much, he sold it to the publishers for $1. And uh, yeah, yeah, I think it's one of Clive's best books, right? Honestly, do. Yeah. I love the book. And I spent a long time trying to do it. And, and but you know what? I one day it will happen, but it, sure, you know, I mean, it's yeah. it's it's a it's it is difficult because I think you know, Clive, it's like me and Clive going, Oh, yes, we're going to make a film for children, and actually, both he and I were pretending to be making something for children, we're, we're both dark as hell, you know, yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you know? and they, they knew that. They're not that yeah. stupid, the guys who work at studios. They knew that they were going to end up with a film that was going to disturb the hell out of them. Yeah, they want something yeah. they could show to children. I well, actually just, just read that book to my son, who's 11, and I hadn't realized when I was reading it to him, like, oh, this is a little darker than I was remembering, you know. And, Way darker, I, the whole Richter thing, this guy. Yeah, I mean, or, and, and a, smile, a, a cat gets a killed by, by boiling water, and there's they get all kinds of fish at the pond yeah yeah and I, my favorite part is when he is when he comes out of the he comes out and he's like, everybody's old and, and and he's not and it's yeah. actually because that is of yeah. course a nightmare of immortality isn't it that right. everyone dies and you stay the same yeah that, 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 very that he lost he lost the experience of living his life with the people he loved that's right yeah it was yeah. taken from him i think it's i think I think Clive weirdly bared his soul in that book. And I, there's something very dark and also quite disturbing at the height of it, which is what I was interested in. And of course, Clive, without pretending to like it, was like, yes, of course, of course, of course. But the guys at Universal were like, we're going to spend $100 million making a really dark art movie that nobody's going to like. Well, yeah. and, and at, at its core, it's a, it's similar to Hellraiser because it's about someone who thinks that life isn't enough, right? That you need to, uh, you need to expand your experience into some kind of magical thing. And then, and this is what you get for it. You know, you, 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 uh, you get taken advantage of, you get uh, tortured. Yeah. And you know, you know you get... Faustian pact and essentially all yeah. of Clyde's stories are some version of Faust or another. Yeah. Basically yeah. And... Clyde's big idea is you meet the devil and you like it yeah yeah but well and and then the the idea that uh that you know you should be satisfied with life as it is you know be happy with with uh, things the way they are yeah <clears throat> that's right and i think in a sense that's why i think there's a sadness that underpins that book that's that's always going to stop it being that, you know, it, it's only on the surface one of those mainstream Disney movies, you know, not, yeah. not anywhere else. So it's kind of never going to happen. In that way, it would only happen if you made it as a weird little film like Paper House. Then it could happen. Yeah. But it, would, it, can't, be, it can't be a huge budget movie. And now it can't be anything but a huge budget, budget movie. So it can't happen. Is there I think any it's kind some... of statute of limitations or do those rights run out at, at some you know, point? I, I would have to examine all the contracts, none of yeah. which I was a party to. Right. Yeah. Clive was signed over in the last yeah. 30 years. And so I can't answer that. Yeah, yeah. those no, those rights are usually a mess. Um, yeah. I know at some point Oliver Smith from St. Trinian's was going to be attached to some kind of animation project for uh, Thief of Always and stuff like that. It's been, it's just being, sometimes being a, an author fan can be frustrating because you hear of all these things that are being worked on and all these stories that have been optioned. And then it's like, when is it coming out? But nowadays with internet, it's even worse because you know every single stumble that someone did, you know that, you know, oh, this guy met with that guy to talk about this and this is going to be, yeah. Back then, you only found out about movies sometimes when they were coming out and they were on the magazine yeah. cover on the newsstand. Well, you, you know, know, you hear about regime changes in 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 uh, in studios. You know that somebody who was a champion for one project is out, and this new other person didn't like that person's stuff, and is like, "No, we're not doing that anymore. Now we're doing my things." Well, I mean, that happens all the time. But also, I think that you know, you also have to realize that with with something like the Thief of Always. 
um, you know, we really tried and we spent a lot of time and a lot of effort trying to map that thing, you know, and money. It was, yeah. you know, get money on it. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, you know what? The, it is the natural state of any movie not to happen. That is normal. When a movie does happen, it's a miracle. When the movie's over $50 million, it's 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 uh, an epiphany. It's like some weird conf conflagration of the stars and you know it, so it's always liable not to happen but you know what um you can only try it doesn't mean you can't try right right of course of course so well, am, I, am i correct that at the at the same time uh you began the short story or the um the uh screen adaptation of tolstoy's novel of the death that, of it yeah I, I made Ivan's Ecstasy, I would say, partly as a response to having spent two years trying to make Thief of Always a Universal and, and not, uh, and I just felt like, you know what, these guys, they just want to run out the clock on your life, like by like tying you up in all this stuff. And, you know, it, it wasn't anybody's fault, of course. It's just, it's just, and why should, you know, agreeing for a corporation to agree to spend that many millions of dollars especially in that era that was a lot of money yeah um, sure um it's still a lot of money but it was even more money then and uh you know you, you can't expect them to do it but at the same time i think what what appealed to me about doing ivan's ecstasy and what still appeals to me about that kind of filmmaking is i realized that the technology was going to allow you you know i wanted to have the same freedom as an artist to make a film as say Clive did, you know, Clive could just sit down at his desk and write that. And that's, that's a huge um, privilege to be able to do that. I mean, obviously I could write a book too, if I felt like it, but um, um, I wanted to try that making a film. And that was sort of the idea of Ivan's Exe was to make something that they would never agree to make because it was everything that they disliked about movies. It's about death. It's about the movie business. It's about, you know, the the Kenneth Anger S dark side exactly of yeah that's everything they hate so they would never make that film and I made it and 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 I remember making it and actually funny enough this is another Roger Ebert story but I I had a clip of it and I showed it at, at a panel we did in Sundance about the, the whole digital filmmaking digital capture was very new this is two thousand and um, we had a panel with a bunch of DPs and Roger was on it Roger moderated no he was in the audience he wasn't moderating the panel and we showed a clip from my a trailer of Ivan's Ecstasy which was like the first film shot in eight on an HD cam and um and I was saying you know the whole point of this is not that it's, whether it's better or worse than 35 mil photography but that it's democratizing that I can just go out and make a film now I don't have to spend a million dollars to make a film I can go and make a film with people I know for under fifty thousand dollars, I can go out and do this film. You know, it's a big, big difference, and you really couldn't do that on any kind of film stock. Yeah, and, um, and that's the point. And Roger, who was sitting in the audience, said, "Yeah, well, but but they won't let anybody see it." He said, and he guffawed. And I thought, "What's he talking about?" He was right. Yeah, the whole. The whole basis of the movie business is not to let more people make films, it's to control the films. Which And one, and the, one of the most important ways in which films are controlled is through their budgets. If it costs $100 million to make a film for mass release, then you know what? You can't make that. You can't make that. He can't make that. Or you can't, or you can't make a movie with that budget. That's going to take risks. It's going to be some established property that they already know. There's a captive fan base for it. You know, like these superhero movies and stuff like that. That's right. But let me tell you, I, this last week I was doing some visuals for this other project I'm working on. And I was playing with this, this new some of these new AI tools, and mm -hmm. you can say things like, "An army marches over this hill." There it is. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, Photoshop just announced a, a new AI <laughs> tool, which can complete things that people are working on and it can make like this person now has a helmet on and, and the helmet will just appear on it on Photoshop. I've seen and it. it and it's way more extreme than that. Right, yeah. I guess, so completing things that you're working on, it's very, very good at. 
but mm -hmm. it can also literally generate things like yeah. make an army that looks like a cross between the army in Spartacus and the army in Game of Thrones. Yeah, we've seen we've seen stuff like uh, you know, oh, it, what if Tron was directed by uh, Alexand uh, Alejandro Jodorowsky or something like that? Yeah, they, they, those things they show up and you know. Yeah, but those things say, those things are just they're they're, they're not curiosities. Really yeah, right. But I'm saying that look, I think one of the things that effects that CGI had is that is it stopped epic things looking impressive to audiences anymore because everything looks uh, impressive so exactly. we're, no, we're no longer like that interesting like you know back in the day when you watch cleopatra you were like there's a lot of people there and they each one of them went through wardrobe you know well, well at the end of candy man you had all those extras from you know the green green community come to the funeral those are real people nowadays it would probably just be the first few in the front and then the rest would be cgi'd well I mean, never mind that. I think a much more important thing in Candyman is that Can the first Candyman has one very important difference from all the others. You know what that mm -hmm. is? What is? Can you not guess? Um, I see. I would say uh, that he's in the 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 urban legend angle, right? I mean that, that no, he's created no, by no. the. It's yeah. a real physical thing. Real bees. Oh yeah. Oh yeah <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. All okay. the. Other all the other films, every single one of them has CGI bees. And you know what? There's a very big difference between real bees and CGI bees. And the difference is that the CGI ones go where you tell them. And the real ones go where they feel like. Right. Yeah. And they might sting you because it is true that people got stung on the set of that film. And you know, yeah, you couldn't do that now because health and safety would say, no, you can't do that. It's it's dangerous and it's um they'd say you were abusing everybody by having a unsafe workplace because they could get sure. I yeah, mean, but back then that was how you did it. I mean how you made a film. It's yeah, like, you, you don't want to yeah. come to work today because because you might get stung, stay home. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh so, so speaking of candy man, we'll just get into candy man a little bit um you you met clive while you were still working for propaganda films right i think clive was directing nightbreed at the time at pinewood yes i wasn't working for propaganda films i was actually yeah. making another film at pinewood and i and i had lunch with clive in the restaurant one day he was mm -hmm. shooting night he was, i think he was doing some pickups from nightbreed and he was there and um i was introduced to him actually by um Kiefer sutherland who i was working with at the time who oh, knew wow so I had lunch with Kiefer and Clive, and and I thought he was very charming, fun guy. You know, we we got we just got along. I thought he was a really interesting person. Um, and um, then, you know, about a year later, I um, I I had read the story of the Forbidden, and and I want and I knew him enough to call him up. We actually shared an agent at CAA at the time, so mm -hmm. yeah. I, yeah, I said I was interested in this and they gave me his number and I called Clive up and I said, um, you know, let's, what do you think about developing this story as a movie? And he said, sure, you can have the rights, you know, to shop it for free. Um, and I want to be a producer on it if you set it up. I went, easy, done. And I actually set it up the very next day at Propaganda. It literally was that easy. Sometimes things are easy. Yeah. How yeah. how did he react to the uh, the change in setting? Uh, you know, to to Chicago. Oh, he was totally into that because at the time Clive was had recently moved to Beverly Hills from uh, where he used to live in um, Baker Street, mm -hmm. and he he he'd only recently moved, and so he was he was very much into the idea of making an American film, and I think both of us were very aware of the problems that account. You know. Hellraiser, which is a wonderful and very seminal movie, is unquestionably compromised by the kind of vagueness of its setting. Mm -hmm. In the and there were all kinds of looping problems. Oh, oh yeah, especially in the second movie where there's that's why the first movie really policemen with weapons, but it's like, is this supposed to be England? Policemen don't have weapons in England. What's going on? It's just kind of fuzzy. I think Clive was given a really hard time with that whole thing, and I think that you know we were both so annoyed with. The sort of lack of accept at the time there was a real lack of acceptance of English movies in the American market, and I said, "Let's just sell it in America. Fuck this shit." 
And so Clive said, yeah, well, where do you want to set it? I said, I, said, I want to set it in Chicago. And I want to go there and do some research. So I just went there. That's basically how it happened. But Clive was 100% behind it. I mean, he, you know, he wanted, he was moving to America at that time anyway. Um, and um, so, yes, so I went to Chicago and um, the, I said to the film commission guys, you know, take me to the worst housing project in the city. <laughs> and he went, oh, that's not going to be hard. And off we went, you know. And that was really how it happened. To Cabrini Green. I was looking a little bit into the history of Cabrini Green and started out as a bunch of shanties in the 1800s. And then apparently at one point, there were a lot of Italians living in Cabrini Green. Um, and then it became a more, you know, more African-American kind of community. But I feel like people focus a lot on race in Candyman, but I think also you were making a point about poverty in the U.S., right? The way that different communities are kind of pushed to the side um, to a place where they, you know, are basically like almost ghettoed in. And th those areas don't have the infrastructure or the uh, proper, you know, access to resources that other communities have. I mean, even the, the very fact that in the movie, uh, Helen's apartment is the same kind of building as the one in Cabrini Green, but hers was finished. Hers has like plaster on the walls instead of cinder blocks and it's painted. But I was seeing the production designer a featurette on this Blu-ray and uh, it, it does seem like uh, she even had the, the same blueprints for the sets for Helen's house and for um, Bernard, um, the one in, uh, in Cabrini Green. Now, by the way, that's all historic. That's all completely accurate. That whole that whole section of the film is, um, I mean, the, the the newspaper article that she's looking at is a real article, and it oh. is true that those that those um, housing projects and the condos were built by the same architect at the same time and have the same design. That's not fiction. Right, right. That's the same thing. Yeah, just basically different sides of the railroad tracks, right? Yeah, I mean, that's yeah. right. I think you it think, is. You can bring up things like redlining and stuff like that, that, that kind of make it so that there's an area that's, you know, this property is not going to be worth as much as the one on this side, but that one's going to be like, I think at one point someone said that the reason why some of these buildings looked unfinished is because um, if they made the projects too good looking, uh, other people in the city would complain that they're making them too nice looking. And true or not, but I mean, I think yeah. what's definitely true is that the places were left in were not were never repaired properly. And yeah, I, I saw well, some. I saw someone talk I about got there, it. Was yeah. everything over a certain floor was 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 pretty much derelict, and 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 they, the elevator doorways were sealed off and, and that's why you had these sort of cavernous spaces there yeah the the really were there. i mean they're then they're, they're not in the real places in the film that there, there was a set but yeah it, it's real it, that's, I, I think, that set was amazing like the set where they were making with the paintings on the walls and the the walls have been knocked down and it looks almost like a cathedral right with the pillars right but it really was like that inside those buildings at yeah. that point they literally yeah. um emptied out and and sealed off the top five or six floors wow i i was um i was hearing about cabrini green and someone was saying that when they were building it they wanted the architect to paint the numbers of the buildings over over the entrance to the buildings just paint the numbers instead of like he said well why do you want me to paint them when i can just use metal numbers and that's actually cheaper and they said, yeah, uh, and it looks better. And they said, yeah, no, but if we make it too good looking, people, they're not going to like it. <laughs> the people are going to complain that we're making it too good looking. And I was like, wow, that's systemic racism right there, right? That's that's uh, the city admitting that, well, if we're going to build a project, we can't make it too good looking or people are going to complain that we're making it too good looking. So, and obviously, I think the thing about the story is that it was originally set in Liverpool, so it was about a housing estate somewhere that was in poor repair, you know, in a very similar way. But I think 
the actual situation in Cabrini Green was honestly a lot more shocking because of the added element, the added racial element. And also just to do with the extraordinary position of the housing project in its proximity to downtown Chicago. You know, it was right there and it was right slap if you know it, in a sense it wasn't it wasn't hidden at all and people were it was a place that people talked about with a sense of dread and and that was you know obviously it's gone now and and it's very changed and it's and the area has been gentrified and that has a whole different set of issues attached to it which were explored um by jordan in the new film and i think that's it's really interesting how i think that to some degree, the demolition of Cabrini Green was not caused by Kenny Man, but it contributed to it. Because it was it wasn't too I, far after the movie, right? I was seeing 1992 horror film Candy Man is released. They knocked the damn thing down. They were they were they, it was it was yeah. it was a problem for the Chicago authorities, and it was yeah. demolished the whole thing, which you know led to a different set of problems. All the displaced people. Yeah, oh, yeah. exactly yeah. yeah they tried they tried in 94 to open it up to a mixed income neighborhood and then in 95 demolition began so it didn't right. it didn't last too long after that three years later that's pretty quick yeah, yeah. but it, it's um i think you really made with the adaptation that you made of the story you really made it like your own and it added so much to it because it's a, it's a short story. So there's not a lot there to, to make it a full feature. So I really appreciated the elements that you, that you put into the story and how much you breathed life into like the myth of the candy man and, and turned it into something completely different, but at the same time, still faithful to the idea of the story that it's like, it's the personification of the violence and the, the feelings of a community that come together and, create this mythical creature I, and in I the end a, yeah go ahead oh yeah i was uh just just like a year into my fandom of clive barker and i was trying to read when i heard that Candyman was coming out i was trying desperately to read all the books of blood in time before i could go see Candyman in the theater and i ended up skipping ahead to read the forbidden right before i went in the theater and and uh watching the movie seeing he, seeing Tony Todd say the lines that the Candyman says in the Forbidden, I'm like, wow, this yeah. is so this is so faithful. Yeah. I mean, I, that that just kind of and and his delivery is amazing too. And that uh, that I I hate to say I was hooked because I you knew it's a, <laughs> but but yeah, I mean, I oh my gosh. I think one of the advantages of adapting a short story as opposed to a novel is that you can do everything that's in the story and then elaborate and expand. Yeah. in other way in other areas and that's that's you know one of the problems with adapting novels especially if they're big heavyweight novels is you end up cutting so much and you don't really know if you're cutting you know if you would i mean if, if someone was to adapt something like weave world for example it, it's that's that's a hard book to put into a movie i think yeah. at least yeah I would love movie. to see it as a, a, a series, like a limited series. No, I'm, I don't think you could do it as less, but you know, it's something to me. When some when somebody tells me something's a series, I'm I'm already bored. I don't know <laughs> yeah. why. I'm like, oh, you mean you're gonna have a theme tune? Uh, <laughs> it's like it's so, like, oh, you're gonna have a title sequence. Oh god, I'm already bored. I don't know why uh, that that's pure prejudice, isn't it? Uh well, I, 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 I would, I would, we, I would take anything I could get, you know, any more. No, I, mean, I know. I'm not saying you shouldn't do it. I'm just saying I don't want yeah. to do it. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Well, and you, you have, I mean, out of every director, you know, aside from Clive, you have the, uh, done the the best adaptation of any, you know, of any of his work. Agreed. Yeah, definitely the most successful. Yeah, well, you know, I think that Clive and I have a very there's a there's a really good um overlap in our sensibilities but we're also very different so i think if there's the there so it's kind of it, it works well you know and i adore clive and i you know he's um i i'm i, I still talk to clive he's such a great guy you know and um such an interesting person very unique 
Another great collaboration that came from Candyman was your it began your collaboration with Philip Glass, which is yeah. an amazing composer, and uh, he he's he's scored at least three three of your movies. Correct. Yeah. And no, I yeah. yeah, Philip is fabulous, and um, and and you know, Philip didn't know that it was a horror film. I mean, that's that stories are out there, and he and he got a little bit surprised when he finally saw the film, and he was like. But um, but he, he then 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 I think he, when he realized how much publishing he was earning from it from being on basic cable, he was he changed his mind and said, "Call me <laughs> up one day and said, oh, let's do another movie." So I was like, <laughs> yeah. "But I've always uh, he's such he's a great guy, Philip, and he's very um, you know he's 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 very down to earth. He's very old school too, which I like about him. He doesn't write scores on computers or he writes them on paper." Yeah, I, I um. I used to have a copy of the Candyman soundtrack, which was yeah. very short. I think it was just a little over half an hour. And then in 2001, finally, he Final. put up, yeah, he put up the the larger, you know, yeah. uh, edition was like an hour. And that was, that was so awesome to have because I was like, oh, finally, I get to listen to more music from Candyman. Yes, please. You know, I have to say, and I wish, I wish I had it still. But none of the versions that have been commercially released are the actual cues. Mm -hmm. They're all things that Michael Reisman redid. And, oh. and um, I, I, obviously I had back in the day like a cassette which had the actual cues on it, but long gone. I don't know why. Like a suite that he made, right? Yeah, but it was it was slightly different. He he mm -hmm. did turn it into a suite, and it's a very effective suite, but it's not the cues as they appear in the film, not even slightly if you listen to it. Did you ever use temp music and Candyman? Yeah, because Philip sent the demos. We had him pretty soon in, in, in production. He, he demoed it and I, I, I temped it with his demos. Okay, yeah. Which, were, yeah. which were great. And then I cut them up and then Michael Reisman recorded them properly. Um, but yeah, Philip came and saw the film. We lost one. Oh. Um, he'll he'll be back. That's okay. Yeah, maybe yeah. he's just switching, or maybe he needed to take a break. Um, yeah. So, and he was. I watched Samurai Marathon last night, and he that's also Philip book. Glass, right? Correct. Yes. And I think there's some tracks are from other projects that he did, right? Yeah. No, some of it is is it's all, it's all it's all re-recorded and and re. Um, written to fit the film, but some of the material comes from other schools. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I love that movie. I just watched it two days ago. That that was. Uh, I I I went to college in Japan, so. I, oh, okay. I, yeah. Yeah, that was so much fun to do that. I mean, you know, who doesn't want to spend uh, a year in the in the Jedi Geki world? You know, it's just such a great place. It's just a great environment. You know. And, I, uh, and a kind of privilege. So I really, I really enjoyed doing that. I have to say. Um, what uh, what got you involved in that uh, in making that production? Um, I was literally asked out of the blue by the producer Jeremy Thomas, who was planning to do that, and he had the idea that he it would be fun to have a. He, he's made a number of films in East Asia, dating back to uh, Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence, and he made The Last Emperor, of course. So he had, yeah. he was, and he and a, a lot of films with uh, Takashi Miike. Uh, he did um, uh, what's it called, Thirteen Assassins. Mm. Oh yeah. And The Last Samurai and various other films. And Nakazawa Toshiaki Nakazawa, who was the Japanese producer, had done a lot of films with Miike, and um, including Thirteen Assassins. Um, and so they, they they just wanted to try something different, and they and so I, I went there and I met with Nakazawa and uh, uh, and all the various other people there, and um, and we got along really well, and and so I rewrote the script and and we just did it, and it was kind of a real adventure. It was a lot of fun. No, oh, I love that movie. Uh, the way that the way that we have some sword fighting, the choreography of it, the handheld camera, and the sword fighting is just looks so good, and just the whole idea of like a, a, a lord would a clan lord would say let's go ahead we're getting too soft let's all go do a marathon and then it gets misinterpreted and 
just the idea, uh, the tension is everybody's running the marathon. And so every, once you're in a big physical exertion like that, it's like everything's going to boil over. Everything's going to come up. And and the whole plot intrigue with, the, you know, Edo and Tokugawa, and it was just beautiful. And it was funny because my wife was telling me that she once saw these um, giant, you know, drum Japanese playing drummers who all run a marathon. And uh, she was telling me, yeah, they run marathons and they, they have to be in shape to beat those big drums. And, uh, and then I, I looked up your um, IMDB and I saw that samurai movie and I saw it last night and I, I could not, I, I was watching it from midnight until like two in the morning. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, the, the marathon is a real event. I mean, at the end of the movie, you do see yeah, the bottom yeah. of that one, which we filmed. And people and, running in like full samurai getup and stuff with their little number on their chest. Yeah. And I was like, wow. Yeah. Or, or Godzilla heads, one of the yes. others. <laughs> yeah. It was, uh, it was very funny when we came to the end and there's all the people in cost, costume and, and the producers are going, I don't know about this shot because you got like, a, you know, a Super Mario, you got a Godzilla, you know, so... Oh. Oh, oh, because of well, like lic licensing yeah 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 it's a nightmare i'm like look i think if you have more than five of them in the same shot it's okay i think it really grounds the end of the movie it really puts us uh it puts the audience like in the chronological chain of events to know that this was real and now they still do this because of this marathon that happened yeah. you know a hundred years yeah, ago no it, it's it's a tradition and and also like a lot of the Japanese culture now, which is sort of what the film is about, is how, you know, after being isolationist for 300 years, once, the, once, they've, once they had contact with the US, everything changed very, very, very quickly. Yeah. Oh, and how awesome is Danny Houston in that as Commodore Perry? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> oh, he's so good. He's, he's in Frankenstein. He's in the Samurai Marathon. He's in, of course, you know, Ivan's Ecstasy. He's, he's such a, an amazing guy, Danny Houston. And, and as and as they talk about in the film, the only people who were allowed to go there were the Dutch, you know. Uh -huh. uh, because if you weren't Dutch and you and in Nagasaki, they would string you up, as per the Martin Scorsese film, The Silence, which is completely accurate. You know, that's what I, you could yeah. not go there. Three hundred yeah. years until the Americans turned up with a bunch of warships, and they were like, "We don't care that you don't want us here. We're here." Yeah, I think the last thing <laughs> I saw. I saw Danny Houston recently in this Netflix documentary. I think it was The Other Side of the Wind about the uh, movie from Orson Welles that never yes, got finished. Yes, I love that movie. It did oh. get finished. That's the point. Right, right. It's it's such a great documentary. Just the you, convoluted you know story. Danny dubs his father's voice in that movie. Oh, really? Oh. Lot of okay. the lot of the recordings of John Houston were lost, and right. Danny basically dubbed them. Oh, wow. okay. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Cause I, I guess some of those shots would have been MOS, so there wouldn't be any sound for them. Yeah, I can yeah. tell when it's Danny's voice doing his father's voice. I really enjoy that. It's a great documentary. Everybody has to watch the other side of the wind. But the movie's great, you know. Yeah. And and you know, that was Orson Wells' thing. That was the whole thing with Ivan Dixie as well. That was the whole idea that Orson Wells was really trying to explore on the other side of the wind. That he, what, and he was doing it in, in 16 mil and was film students and he was just wanted to make something that was outside the, the system. I mean, it is extraordinary that there is this incredibly powerful art form that essentially governments and corporations know, know how powerful it is and do everything in their power. Right. Harder to, for someone to make it. And if you do make it, unless it's fully authorized through their system of, of approvals like film festivals and prizes, no one will ever see it even if you make it. And it's, it's, it, there is a, there's a lot of fear involved in that. And it's, it's like, it is the idea that cinema can only be an official art. And you know, that was partly what, one of the reasons why I'm very proud of Traveling Light, which was the film that I made in May, 2020. And it was actually illegal to make a film. Right, the pandemic oh, was on, yeah, right? right? Yeah. 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 Exactly. I, I, you know, which is hilarious when you think about it, because it was probably less coronavirus in Los Angeles in May 2020 than there is now. Well, that's oh, yeah. true, but people are more immunized towards it, too. Well, so well, well, so they t or, or, or so you think. I mean, yeah. it, it, I mean, it, it's it. The film is uh, like a sort of chronicle of, of the sort of weird 
behavior and stuff that went on that way at that time. And I think obviously I didn't know what was going on and nobody else did. I think it feels it has a sort of really eerie accuracy and unpleasant quality to it because, you know, it's about the things that people didn't want to admit were really going on, like rich people were having parties and then I, yeah. and complaining that poor people should bring them their food with masks on. And that's, and yeah, and of course that eventually leads to social unrest, which is what happens in the movie. I didn't invent any of that, it really happened. There were, of course, serious social unrest at the end of May in Los Angeles that was caused by the murder of George Floyd. George Floyd, yeah. And, um, uh, but it's also, I think as much as it was caused by George Floyd, I think it was caused by the idea of locking people down in their homes. Mm. It's like, it's almost like a riot is almost a response to that. It added a lot to the tension that was already growing. And the, yeah, uh, yeah. this idea of like a, a larger authority stepping in and telling you how to live your life and what to do. I mean, the film is, I think, look, the film is, I think to some people unwatchable because it was a trauma that we all experienced and nobody wants to revisit it or even remember that it happened. But once you see it and it takes you right back to that moment, and obviously it's got nothing to do with things like vaccines because there weren't any vaccines in May 2020. You know, never, nobody even knew what that was. And, you know, that's become a whole nother kind of weird issue. But, right. but just the whole thing of these people telling you things like you can't go outside, you can't gather on a beach. Oh, really? Yeah. It, it, was, I mean, it was strange. Yeah. It was strange. Yeah. I mean, I mean and I, it was just wrong. And there's never been a moment where they go, oh, yeah, you know, uh, we're wrong. They've never said that, have they? But you, when you look at what they were telling people to do, none of it was right. Not, not one person thinks that was accurate. Yeah. And yet everybody was like, oh, we better, we better do that. We better. They were they were closing roads in Europe and they were telling people you can't travel. You can't go to work. You can't take this highway. It's going to be closed off. It you closed can't travel. Off. I'm yeah. like, how, how, what? Like in America, of course, very little of that happened. Um, you know what happened in LA? But I was, my brother was in Portugal. I was telling me, yeah, you can't, uh, there's places here where you can't, you know, if you're going to go take a walk by the seaside, someone will come over a policeman and say, you have to go home and, you know, locked down. And I was like, what? Like, if there's nobody around, I can't walk down the street by the beach. No, they'll tell you to go home, you know, and you can't travel. Like you can't take this freeway. It's going to be closed. They're going to turn you around, send you back. It's like, really? I was like, that's crazy. But you, you know, have, you should have taken the advantage of the moment and killed a lot of them then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess. I mean, it, but, it was, it was pretty awful and, and horrific. And, and I think it's really damaged people. I think people are insane from it. You well, know? yeah. I mean, I got depression during the pandemic. I, I I did not have depression before. And now I have depression after the pandemic. Uh, there's a lot of people. Luckily, I was working throughout most of it. But a lot of people, this destroy their lives. You know, I mean, they destroy right, their, their, businesses, their, lives, their lives, their businesses, their jobs, uh, like, even like, family family life and i think you know it was especially bad for kids at school and in college i think they they no one has talked about how much they suffered and they were never mm -hmm. at risk for anything mm -hmm. there's a, a a small generation of kids who don't know what it's like to be running around the schoolyard and playing with their friends they were just doing that at home from a computer yeah and you know what and the, now the information they're telling us is that none of it made the slightest bit of difference to the outcome well, it definitely, we realized that the virus would never go away. It's always going to be around. So I knew that right at the beginning. I was like, this is going to be like the influenza virus or the, the, the Spanish flu. It's not going to be like something that's going to disappear. It's always going to be around because it's always going to be spreading and mutating and stuff. So, I mean, uh, humans have dealt with this stuff since the very beginning of history. And it always causes a kind of mass insanity and fear. It's, no. I mean, literal terror, it, it sparks in people. And I think my film catches that. I didn't plan it that way, but I realized this was going on. I thought, wow, I could shoot something that's truly terrifying in real time and, and base it around Tony Todd and what was going on with him. Right, right. So, and he's really magnificent in it. And I think yeah. Tony, Tony is such a fabulous actor. Um, and, you know, I, 
obviously, I say it's a shame he was pigeonholed. I, I'm the I'm the guy who pigeonholed him. But um, I think that, you know on this the, the flip side of that is the only thing that's good thing about being typecasting is it's better to be typecast than to be not cast at all. But Tony is so much bigger than that. Oh, he's so Absolutely. prolific. I mean, he's in everything just about. And he's such a good actor, you know. Yeah. And such a nice guy. So, you know, I'm a big Tony fan. And I think that traveling, like, yeah, it's, you, you're going to watch it and you, and most of you will just hate it because, because I'm sure most of you just hated what the world was like in May 2020. But, you know, 10 years from now, it'll be a, a ghastly reminder. Yeah. Would your, your daughter Ruby, Ruby Jean was involved on the soundtrack? That's correct. Yes. Yes. She was doing music on it. Yeah. A couple of her songs on the film. Yeah. Wow. And so Tony Todd's character, Caddy, is looking for his son in the streets of, of uh, uh, L.A. And then so this was a complete coincidence that at some point you, you saw that Tom, Tony was actually looking for his son. That... Well, and I think it was more the other way around. Oh. That we were, he was looking for his son, and I was filming it. <laughs> oh, okay. So that's kind of how it started with the story. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh. Okay, I understand. Yeah. We, so, we, were, we were making this film up. We were like trying to capture really what was going on, and that was really part of what was going on. And so it, it it gives the film a kind of spine and a kind of emotional core, and it's and it's and it's not it's completely real. Yes. I think that's very interesting because it's almost like a documentary, but he's playing a character while he was actually looking for his son. Uh, he's been very, he's been open about it on Twitter. He mentioned yeah. that his son, Alex is bipolar and, um, and he was looking for him at one point. He tweeted that he had left a program that he was on, but recently I'm very happy to say, I think they're very well connected now. And last uh, tweet that he did on May 16th, he posted a picture of his son saying another blessed day with my son. So it looks like things are much better now. Oh, I, th I think that's true. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, the, that didn't happen during the production of the film. So the film, and we have to see it. I don't want to give it away. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and Danny Houston as uh, that as a character. Crazy, he's a crazy preacher. Yes. That's another thing that the pandemic caused. A lot of people were following people who were just spewing nonsense, right? I mean, I don't know what people were looking for a, an easy way out of what they were dealing with, I guess. Yeah, I think, look, I mean, it's very like during the Black Death, you, you have a rise of people talking complete insanity in the church and everything else. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's it's a cycle in human existence that these things create um terrible you know humans humans believe in magical thinking and they want oh this guy has the answer if i do this i won't die i'll go to heaven if i do die and you know who you know it's all it people believe things which are patently not true that's i can't i can't no one is going to be able to stop them that's human beings so yeah it was i think it was that's yes the film is about the rich people having the parties the crazy people winding people up online to do absolutely terrible things and in the middle of it the poor people are in the restaurant trying to make earn a living with masks on frying food you know yeah it was really hard it was really hard it's um and of course the film is also about the people who are unhoused and on the street which in los angeles was at that point it was unbelievable. It was like a giant explosion of it. I mean, it's still bad, but it was even worse. Then. I remember early <clears throat> around March of 2020 or April of 2020, when people were still posting like empty photos of big cities. Yeah. And it was just like, this is, you know, London with nobody on it. And then this is Los Angeles with nobody on it. And then there's like, oh, here are some deers coming back into the city. It's like, yeah. Wow, that was kind of a little weird. That was a little, you know. I shot scenes on Hollywood Boulevard, absolutely deserted with every single shot shot. Imagine what that would have cost if I was trying to fake it now. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Like that Tom Cruise movie where he's on, in the middle of Times Square. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, we just got Crazy. it all for real while it was going on, you know. Wow. So were you, were you a big fan of like the Universal monster movies when you were growing up? 
I love I love the James Well Frankenstein. I, yeah. I mean, fan of, I love. I mean, yes and no. I mean, I think my favorite early horror film is definitely Todd Browning's Freaks. Oh yeah, that's that's. I mean, great I love stuff. Todd Browning. I love the un, unknown. I love a lot of his silent movies. I think actually Dracula is one of his weakest weakest movies. Weirdly enough, because but I, I absolutely adore a lot of other things that Todd Browning did, and it's, and a lot of the Lon Chaney films. Not necessarily the Phantom of the Opera, which is it's, a, it's an odd film because its art direction is great and it obviously mm -hmm. inspired the stage show very closely. But yeah. as a film, it doesn't quite come off. Um, but obviously, Nosferatu is a masterpiece. Yeah, yeah. Right now and uh, so yeah. Do you like the Herzog version, the one with Klaus Kinski? Have you yeah. seen that one? Yeah, I like it, but not as much as the Monet. Yeah, because it's. I've got this huge set of all the Universal, and this was actually David J. Skull, the horror movie historian, uh, personal copy. He sold it once through Facebook, and I got it. So, yeah. uh, and Clive Barker is in some of these features, like Bride of Frankenstein. I think Clive is talking about the movie there. Well, I uh, love the film that Bill Condon and made that Clive. Was Gods and Monsters. Gods and Monsters. Yeah, yeah. it's a great with uh, Brendan Fraser. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think that won an Oscar for best adapted screenplay. I think that's right. And and yeah. Bill Condon, of course, directed the second Candyman. That's right. Yes, yeah. which he he took it in a different direction than what you were going to do on your planned sequel. That's uh, right. Yeah, I mean, in the original ending. I mean, most people probably don't know, but the original Candyman ending in your script that I'm looking at. Um, after the funeral scene, it would just cut back to Candyman's lair, and we would like focus into like Helen's. That, that um, was a it, yeah, that was a rewritten ending. The, the the version before that ended the way that the film ends now. I actually shot that version, and then I went, and then everyone went, oh, we should go back to what Bernard originally wrote. Oh, so watch. the original yeah. one was with Helen coming coming after uh, Trevor. Yeah. yeah. Okay. 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 And everyone was like, oh, that's a bit too much of a kind of corny button on a horror movie. And I, and then, of course, they were testing it. And they were like, oh, this film really needs a corny button. And I'm like, yeah, I thought so. <laughs> <That's good. laughs> I like both endings, but I think yeah. I would have preferred the one where we just see the bees in the wall and then we see Helen's face. I think that would have been a really good ending, too. I could see how that would have been. A I good mean, I've ending. seen it like that. It's not as effective. Yeah. yeah. Trevor needed his energy. comeuppance. Then he has so much energy when he does Helen's name in the mirror. People, it's just, it's, you know, you want, you want to go out with a bang. And I'm sorry, that could, that's a bang. The other one was like, oh, interesting. Yeah. It's funny because I've seen interviews yeah. where you, you mentioned that you would like to have picked up the story again the next day after, you know, they find Trevor dead in the bathtub. And well, that's how the sequel should have been done. But I, but sure. I never wrote it that way. So, no, no one really ever had a viable project which were, was right. like, but you know, I think we should do it now and and bring Virginia back. You know, oh, yeah, they were they were trying to they do reference Helen in the new version, right? They so, do, yes. Yeah. So you hear and at one them. at one point they had like a previous version by uh, Rose, Rosenfeld and uh, Peel, where they wrote a script where. Helen would show up, her ghost would show up with like a piece of fabric over her face with a painted face on it. And she would be like a burned, you know, thing. I think I have the, the, that script draft. I, I can share that uh, if you guys want. Um, but there was a trailer shot in a church at the end of the movie that that shot in the trailer never made it to the final film, but there's like a woman in a white dress with a burnt face that looks just like Helen. And she was just sitting on a pew in the church. And then they, they cut that out of the final movie, I guess. But at some point they were thinking of bringing Helen in to show up in the movie. Um, so that would have been kind of interesting, I think. Maybe they wouldn't have gotten Virginia Madsen, of course, but- no, I, I think I think they did try that. Yeah, I think she appeared to read something. Uh, she, she, she was Virginia in on a, a cassettes, I think, in the library. Yeah, pretending Virginia, to be yeah. her thesis tapes that she right. had Virginia recorded. Virginia did do some work on the film and some of it was cut out. That's my mm. understanding. Mm. I, I like the gentrification angle that they went with. I thought that was a, an interesting, clever thing to use. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, and they brought back uh, the mother of baby Anthony. And, and you know, that, that was... Oh, yeah, yeah, Vanessa, yes. Yeah, yeah. they brought well, her back, Vanessa back Williams. We're not aged a day in 30 years, I'd like I to... I know! Know. <laughs> it's like, what? It's like, it's 30 <laughs> years now. Yeah. I think it's very funny when you look at that and you go, who knew? <laughs> yeah, right. She was very young in the first one. She was younger than you think she was. She was younger than you think she was in the first one and older than you think she is now, which is interesting. <laughs> but, you know, that's how it goes, I guess. You know? Yeah. She's immortal. Yes. Yeah. Vanessa, she should, she should now, she should now truly advertise herself as ageless. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Ian, uh, so do you have any? Oh, yeah, go ahead. I was going to ask Ian, do you have any more questions about uh, Candyman? Oh, about Candyman. Well, yeah, I would, I would, I understand you uh, hired Anthony Richmond because he had worked together with um, Nicholas Rogue on previous films. Yeah, that's correct. And I, I knew Nick very well and had worked with him on some things that we did together a couple of times in the 80s. And, um, uh, and yeah, Tony, had been um, Nick's assistant on Walkabout and on various other things on Dr. Zhivago, which Nick started and got fired on after a few weeks. Um, and I think he worked with Nick on Lawrence of Arabia too. Um, so they they went back a long way. And and of course, then Tony shot Don't Look Now and The Man Who Fell to Earth and Bad Timing for Nick. And uh, Tony also shot the Beatles thing that... Um, uh, Peter Jackson made into that huge long show. Oh, That's yeah. all about Tony Richmond. I remember actually when we were doing Kenny Man, Tony saying to me, oh, yeah, I made this thing with the Beatles. They didn't release it all. It was amazing. I was there for weeks. And I was like, what boring me about this, Tony? And then that came out. I was like, I called him out and I said, Tony, I had no idea. It's so beautiful what you shot. I know, did you ever see that documentary? It was amazing. Anyway, it's all shot by Tony Richmond. Um, so I love Tony. He's a really good documentary cameraman, as you can tell, even though that's not what people know him for. He also shot uh, Sympathy for the Devil for Jean-Luc Godard. So Tony, Tony's one of those really interesting guys mm -hmm. who get around in ways that you can't, that, that most people haven't. And, um, you know, he was on Dr. Zhivago. He, was on, he, was, he worked for David Lean, for Jean-Luc Godard, for Nick Rogue. I mean, this is an interesting person i think he was nick's assistant when they did fahrenheit 451 so he also worked for um truffaut wow i don't know if he was was nick shot mask of the red death for roger corman he was a dp himself um so these guys all were very went back to the big the big names you know of that era it, it's uh it's it's uh a little sad that uh, nowadays because of the technology and all that stuff we don't have as many people with that knowledge and craft of, you know, the lens of the camera that can. Well, that, it, there was yeah. a tradition that was definitely in operation in that era where a lot of those camera teams would stick together for years. Mm -hmm. they, they'd slowly get promoted from loader to first AC to operator to DP and they wouldn't, you know, and they, they, these people didn't go to film school and come out and go, I'm a DP. You know, I'm a DP. Where's my latte? They didn't do that. They were, they they worked in the trenches, you know, and they and they carried the cases up the hill, and and they stood in the rain, you know, fighting to keep make sure that the equipment would stay dry, and 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 they that was that was their background, and and they were taught, you know, guys like Tony, he would worked with Nick Rogue as a DP. He'd worked with Jeffrey Unsworth as a DP. He'd worked with Freddie Young as a DP. He'd worked with, you know, these these are the the the, the names that come from that era. You know, when I was on Dark Crystal, we had uh, Ozzy Morris as a DP, who, who was one of the greats. You know, Ozzy shot all of John Huston's films. Oh, yeah. Ozzy shot Oliver the Musical. You know, o Ozzy shot mm. on the Roof. These guys, are, these guys had... Um, and, and they had no, a knowledge that they imparted. So I feel like I was, when, when people say, where did you, how did, where did you, who did you learn camera off? I said, well, off of Tony Richmond and 
Ozzy Morris and uh, you know, and those people learn off the people who really invented the business because prior to them, or Peter Sushitsky, who shot Immortal Beloved, and you know, Peter's father, Wolfgang Sushitsky, was one of the first uh, DPs who ever existed. Actually, these guys went back to the silent era. The film is much shorter than you think it is. And sure. you know, now that generation has, you know, Tony is still around, he teaches at UCLA actually. Um, and he's a very good teacher, and he has a lot to acknowledge to impart. But um, the um, that generation which I had direct contact with are now gone because they're they're either gone or they're retired, you know. And there is definitely now th these people who were very very seriously grew up in the film era, and a, and not just the film the 90s film era where the film stocks were really fast and it was easy again but the, the 70s and the 60s where these film stocks were like 25 asa so you had to bring in huge firepower just to get an exposure the lights yeah that was the if, if, if the sun wasn't out you, you needed to bring in 10k lights on an exterior right right never mind night interiors it was a whole different thing you know well, for for uh, Ivan's ecstasy, I mean, you used a lot of uh, natural light, right? That was for me. That was that was the experiment to not have lights. Yeah. You know, now that's every show. Yeah. But when I did it on that film. I said, I don't want any lights. People said, You've gone crazy. I said, yeah. Well, let's see. Well, I mean, Barry Lydon, <laughs> yeah. uh, Kubrick also tried to. He tried to push the technology to shoot without lights too, like to use as much natural light as possible, right? Are you sure about that? Wasn't it like Barry Lyndon? That's the myth. You see, oh. it's very interesting. And I have to tell you, this is one of my pet peeves, is that if you look at the interview that John Alcott gives with the American cinematographer back in the day, John Alcott, who shot that film, has been dead for a long time. Mm -hmm. He never said that. And Kubrick oh. never said anything about any of it. But um, but I was late in his life, became not good friends, but an acquaintance of uh, Leon Vitali, who definitely was in a position to know because he was playing Lord Bullingdon in those scenes. And I'd always, I, I, I'm a huge fan of Barry Lyndon. I saw it when it came out and I've seen it many, 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 many times since. And I've always looked at it and I've always had all these people say, yes, he had a 0 0.7 lens and he could shoot this extreme wide open and shoot solely with candlelight. And I've always gone, that's just not true. It's mm. partially true, but there are, f there are electronic fells in all those scenes. And let me give you the most extreme example. It's a little mythologizing, right? Well, in the famous scene where Ryan O'Neill kisses Marisa Berenson outside after they've met over the gaming table. And it's a night exterior. And they come out. It is lit with a brute arc. There are there is no candle moonlight. Right, right. There is a right. it's it's shot in slight slow motion, and it, there is a there is a ten k light hitting them right in the face, and you know, and the outside. So a lot of those exteriors that you can tell. Yeah, there are, there are lights. The lights are outside the windows. And I said all this to Leon. I said, I asked him once. I said, you know, I've got a question to ask you. I don't want to ask you in public, but but. It's nonsense, isn't it, that they didn't use the electronic light on Barry Linton? And he looked at me like I was the first person who noticed. He said, he said, there were so many lights outside the windows when we were shooting, we nearly set one of the places on fire. <laughs> yeah, you know, I think audiences know a lot less about the magic of films than sometimes producers think. Um, Oh, and I well, think yeah. it's just certain lies just get repeated right. endlessly. That it's is a simplification yeah. just to for people to understand a little bit more about yes, how the movie yes, was made. It was his intention to make it look like candlelight, and he succeeded right. beyond doubt to convince you that it was candlelight. It was not. Mm. Understood. Understood. Yeah. Um, does anybody have any more questions? You see, I can, um, here's the thing I think is interesting. I can say that. And you still don't believe me because you, you you guys are no. I believe you. I believe you. I mean, I'm looking at I'm looking at a picture right now 
uh, of a scene in Candlelight. And yeah, I, I guess those three candles would not be able to light all the ballroom. And if you look, there's no black around. in the frame. It goes, it goes with orange light right to the wall. So you right. know damn well there was some very soft, even low intensity fill light with an orange filter on there that was making that happen. Because if you do that even today with the most sensitive digital chip, and all these people are doing that today, and frankly, their films just look black. Mm. They don't look good at all. Yeah, you know, yeah. just because yeah. you're not using light or you're using low intensity doesn't mean you, that, that, that we want to look at a black frame, because frankly, I don't. Absolutely. It's not interesting. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I don't know if you used to watch Game of Thrones, but there was one particular episode near the end of the show where everybody complained that the show that the, the episode was too dark and they couldn't see anything. Yeah. It's a battle that takes place at night. So immediately everybody was complaining about it. So yeah, yeah. that's not interesting to see something that's too dark. That, that's happening a lot now. And, I, and actually, I think a lot of that is actually caused by the fact that people are grading for uh, UHD and Dolby Vision. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it looks great in that format and then it's compressed for streaming it's compressed for screening and 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 and, and a lot of these tvs that people have sold at great expense they claim to have these features they're not i mean one of the big lies in streaming is 4k there isn't there isn't the technical ability to stream in 4k right it's always going to be fluctuating it's an absolute lie yeah. They're not allowed to admit that. Well, they'll all be sued. There'll be a class action against them. In fact, let's start one now. But if you actually look at the small print, they don't actually advertise. They don't guarantee you 4K. They, as you say, they something, I mean, you, you barely get HD, basically, is what I'm trying to tell you. So all these things that are great for Dolby Vision, you know, huge differences between light and dark, huge things and they're all compressed and ending up on the tv it just looks like black yeah and, and, then, and then the audience goes i can't see anything you go, no you can't you're absolutely correct that's you know, why that's why you know physical media is still king yeah. for people who want to see quality you know because yeah. now we got Candyman in 4k yeah, I yeah just there got it is the, ah yeah, there. there we go there you go you see physical media is important and also i think um it's just Doing everything too dark is, I was watching a film the other day and I was like, this isn't weird or arty or fun. It's just bad lighting. Mm -hmm. You know, we were taught back in the day, you know, like I said, I was taught by a much old, you know, a group of DPs who were generations older than me. We were taught that never to have the frame go black, always to have something there. And that was partly to do with the fact that Back in the 80s, for example, we were delivering to VHS. VHS literally could not recreate black. It couldn't, it would just be a gray mush. So you always wanted something there. In the, because otherwise it would just be hideous on somebody's TV. Yeah. Oh, you know what I was watching the other day? I was watching this. Oh, what is this? This is black oh, and Robinson. white. Yeah, yeah, but this is that black and white concert, uh, Black Knight, White Knight, which... Um, they had Bruce Springsteen. They had a whole bunch of people in it. Did you shoot a music video for Roy Orbison or? I did, yes, in Nashville in 1985. And it was actually, uh, it was part of the soundtrack of Nick Rogue's film, Insignificance. Oh, and I see, okay. Yeah. I did kind of, and it's called Wild Hearts Run Out of Time. It's, it's on YouTube. Well, if you get a chance to see Black yeah. Knight, White Knight, it's in black and white. It's a concert movie. It's really good. It's really amazing. I just saw this the other day. Roy was but, a real character and he was kind of wonderful. And it's very yeah. sad that he was, he was pretty much forgotten when I first went there and did that with him. But then he had this huge career revival with the traveling Wilburys and with that. And he just, it was time for him to come back. And then yeah. He, he passed away almost immediately. Yeah, he, he closed down a little bit after his wife passed away. But then, like you said, he had a, a revival. And uh, yeah, unfortunately, it didn't last too long. He had no. that, that song for him written by Glenn Danzig, too. Yeah, and he was amazing. He had what a voice. Does anyone have any more questions? Um, well, I guess uh, Candyman to the Midnight Meat Train. Uh, I know yeah. you've talked about this before. Um, uh, can you tell us about a little bit about uh, 
about that i mean about the 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 genesis of that what did you think of the midnight meat train film that actually got made i actually never saw it was it any good i liked it yeah yeah, yeah. it, it had right. some it had uh it, it studio interference issues i mean as it far had as brooke, like... brooke shields and uh bradley cooper are in it right and there's a who was the director who's a japanese dude right uh ryuhei kitamura right that's right that's right yeah, cool. that's right yeah, well, definitely catches the gist of the story. But uh, but what what uh, when you worked on that, how are you going to connect those things together? The Candyman and the Midnight Meat Train. Good question. I mean, you know, it, it was a complicated situation. I mean, I think ultimately, I mean, I regret not having. It would have been much better to have developed. Um the canny man sequels and, and to have and to have done all that but they weren't they were suddenly in such a hurry and then of course as soon as they didn't like what i wrote they were no longer in a hurry and it took them much longer because it always takes longer and i and i had another project that i really wanted to do which was my beethoven film mm -hmm. yeah i just watched that this morning I, so they should have, love it. that's right well so they should have they shouldn't have been in such a hurry but they were in such a hurry and mm -hmm. so and you know it's that thing of success Failure is an orphan and success has many fathers. And the moment the first Candyman came out, a lot of people who will remain nameless, who, who had very little to do with the film, um, decided its success was entirely because of their genius, you know. Mm. Not Clive, I hasten to add, who was always very supportive. But, you know, they were in a hurry and they wanted to do it. And I really wanted to do this other film. And so I was, it was like, it was a hard thing to concentrate on and, and as much as it would have been nice to have certainly stayed in charge of the, the whole thing and done it and i'm actually kind of glad i didn't because because although i think bill condon did a good job with the sequel and i think jordan did a good job with his version it's it's you're in a hiding to nowhere making a sequel to that film because it's very self-contained yeah and it's always going to be it's really hard to make a sequel to horror films that's convincing because you know it's that thing of all the tension in a horror film is you're waiting for the you know the bad guy to appear and once he appears what well, all he or she can do is kill more people so yeah. when you're in the second movie they can't you can't wait half the film for them to turn up everyone's going to be throwing shit at the screen so that you know they're yeah they're being you're either going to kill more people in the sequel or you're going to explain the monster in the sequel and yeah. I think that they took. We're going to start telling jokes. One or yeah. the other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like Freddy Krueger. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You yeah. become a stand-up, and either way, it's not funny. Why do you think they've never been able to make? And boy, have they tried! They've never came close to a sequel to The Exorcist. And the amount of money, time, and effort, and people have, yeah. have slaved and labored. Oh boy! Yeah. Well, Lot movies of sequels tv shows they had to produce two different sequels at one point and release both of them That's it right. it's never going to work it's always yeah. going to be forget it forget it it's done you're never going to match yeah. that film it's like yeah. you know, they've tried it with the shining they've tried to make sequels and remix and every time they hit the floor with a bigger thud right mm -hmm. yeah. yep because yeah. you can't and 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 if people want more candy man they can go back and watch the first one too i mean that's listen i want them to i wish they would make one a year i when, when jordan first wanted started wanting to do this he said he, he wanted to do three and i was like please but you know i don't know if that's going to happen i suspect not mm. yeah well let's it's hope really so. hard you know it's not yeah. it's yeah. not easy yeah and well that, that, and he that knows what he's doing that that movie was great that was a that was a it was a terrific homage to to the to your original film um and plus it kind of and and it focused on the the urban legend part of Candyman, the candy man yeah. origin you know yeah yeah but gordon was the perfect person to take charge of that but i think he you know look he's he's also very busy with his own things so what can you say yeah all right um this, this has been this has been amazing. Does anybody have one last question? Yeah, there's something I'd like to know. Uh, I understand you're working with Al Pacino on K King Lear. You wrote a script for it. This uh, is true. Yeah, yeah. Could you tell yeah. us more? Yeah. yeah, because 
Yeah, no, I mean, it was one of those odd things. Al just contacted me out the blue. I've known him for a while, just socially, and he asked me if I'd like to do it. And there can only be one answer to that question, right? Yeah. Um, Hoo-ha! Exactly, yeah, something like that. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're, we are very much actively working on that right now. And, um, it's you know, it's it's an exciting thing. It's not going to be simple because it's mm-hmm. not an easy thing to do. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, we'll we'll keep an eye out for that. And I'm definitely going to rent out uh, Traveling Light. You said people probably won't like to see it, but it's like, to me, I saw the trailer and I just, I, I it's just amazing. Like the photography, the vibrancy of the colors that you put on it and uh, just, it looks amazing. I'm, I'm really looking forward to watching Traveling Light. So I'll, I'm, uh, I'm very proud of it. I think people yeah. should check it out. I think they might get more out of it than they imagine. We'll you know, put think, a link on the show notes for people who want to rent the movie. So anything uh, that's to do with the pandemic, it's like, it's like, it's just, I think it, people, if people like just go, <laughs> you know, yeah. Yeah, because it we we want it to be over, and it's not quite there yet. I mean, it's like ninety percent, I guess, right? No, I as think far as like, it's people, over. As far as, far as how people over. want to deal with it, it's over. But yeah. I think I think the the film shoves your your face right back in May twenty twenty, and that isn't necessarily uh, what people want to be for a, a, a Wednesday afternoon, you know. <laughs> Because there were a lot of stories that because we were all in lockdown, there's a lot of stories out there that people didn't get to see that they don't know that happened. You know, we it, a lot of stuff disappeared while people were in lockdown. And then we would come out and be like, oh, that place is closed. What happened there? And we don't know. So there's well, a the lot. Way of- I, yeah. The way I made the film as well as I went on my own to all these different people's houses because I knew where they all were because they were all at home. So I, it, I didn't do any of it on Zoom or anything. There is, right. you know, I, 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 I was. Um, I went there and shot it. So you get to see what was going on in all these different places. And we went yeah. from one end of the city to the other. We went from South Central to Malibu and through yeah. the Hollywood Hills and through Hollywood Boulevard. So we went all over the city. There's parts of Skid Row in the movie too. I thought I saw people in tents in the streets and everything. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We were in Skid Row. We were in the encampment on Coenga. We Is, were- isn't that crazy though? I mean, Skid Row, when you see images of Skid Row, isn't that incredible that in the middle of LA you got that much of a homeless community just I, living on the streets and and it seems to just be like that for years it's it's kind of nuts it and and honestly it's it's not just there it's all over as well yeah, I mean, yeah. it's 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 shocking frankly but you know there are things that are shocking i feel like sometimes you just got to you know document them because you don't exactly they don't put them in the movies they don't put that in the movie. When they show you LA, they never they don't show you the, the tent encampment. Right. Yeah. Right. And yeah, right. and the people, the people who are in the film playing unhoused, some of them, not all of them, are really unhoused people as well. Yeah. No, I I think that you need to put that uh, out there because like one one time I remember I saw a documentary about a war reporter, and this was a war reporter cameraman, and he was saying, um, that, for example, what we see from war on TV in the news, it's just a very sanitized, very filtered version. You know, he said, I wish that they would put like footage that I've taken in Kosovo and whatever people with their guts hanging out on the side of the road, you know, to make people like puke their dinner out while they're watching the news. Maybe people needed to have that stuff shown to them so they understand what a war is. It's not just economy or refugees or this it's the, all this violence and people just don't get to see almost any of that they well, just they, they, they allowed they, that once and look what happened they allowed yeah. that with the vietnam war and very very quickly people were yeah. on mass in the street saying stop yeah exactly yeah and so they will never allow that again that's true yeah. that's true absolutely happened yeah well, Bernard, this has been terrific. Well, uh, thank you so much for talking to me. It was a fun conversation. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for. We should have thought of this years ago. And thanks. I'm for, surprised you thanks didn't. To Ian, Ian, for helping us put this together because we, we, yeah, we, we've had this podcast for 12 years. And what was I like, know why you have. Why did, I, you've had Clive on it, right? I'm sure, right? A, yes. a couple of times yeah, he's have. called in. Yeah. 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 It was. It was fun. It was fun. We had one. Uh, our episode number. 
300. I think we had yeah. all the Cenobite actors at the same time, some writers wow. live dropped in. We had people from Nightbreed show up. It was all a big Zoom meeting. So that was that was a fun yeah. episode. Um, but, but again, but you know, uh, you made my dream come true uh, by being here today. And thank you so much for making Candyman and all your movies. And I really, I, I, let's stay in touch. All right. Well, thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Have a great weekend. Awesome. That was All great. Right. Yeah. Well, uh, coming soon, we're going to be doing A to Z commentary. Z is for zombies, and we'll be doing uh, uh, the uh, Day of the Dead. Uh, and we'll have more um, more classic commentaries, and we'll return to Jericho Squad 77. And that's as much as we have planned at this point. Sounds great. Yeah. Another great episode. Thanks yeah. for uh, thanks for pushing us towards doing this, Ian. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And this podcast, having no beginning, will have no end. Thank you for joining us, and we hope you have subscribed. You can find the Clive Barker Podcast wherever you find audio. Show notes for this episode, as well as news and reviews, can be found at our website at www.clivebarkercast.com. The Clive Barker Podcast, or BarkerCast, is an independent editorial podcast and blog that is not affiliated with or under contract by Clive Barker or Seraphim Inc. This is a labor of love by the fans for the fans. You can chat with us on our Facebook BarkerCast listeners group, our Facebook page, Twitter, or our new Discord server. Watch for our annual Kickstarter fundraisers to get some cool stuff, and you can buy t-shirts on our Tee Public store. Go to tpublic.com and search for BarkerCast. Opening music by Ray Norrish. End credit music by Matt Furness. Thanks for listening. <laughs>